We managed to catch up with John Watson, manager of Gautier, Silverchair, Missy Higgins, among others. John, thank you so much for joining us. No problems. John, how has your role as a manager changed over the years? Uh, I think the music business, if you think of it as being like an ecosystem, record companies were sort of the dominant species. They held the most space in the ecosystem. Record companies have shrunk in size and number. They haven't disappeared, but they've reduced in size and number. And so other species have to grow to fill that space. And that places more onus on artists and managers to do a lot of the things that record companies still do, but that record companies particularly used to do. So the days of the artists and managers sitting back and letting the uh, record company handle marketing and promotion are long gone. The artists and manager now need to be doing a lot of that stuff themselves and in a true partnership with record companies. Uh, if you sit around waiting for someone else to do it these days, it's just not going to happen. Do artists have a lot more work to do today before getting a manager? Yeah, I think there's a lot more onus on artists to get to first base themselves these days. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's you know, a good opportunity for them to really work out what they want to say, who they want to be. It's also a good opportunity for them to form a really tight connection with an audience that can then sustain them. It gives them greater leverage in terms of their ability to strike decent deals once they do get to first base, they look for someone to help them round the bases from there. Um, and it also gives them a leg to stand on if they've got someone wanting to meddle creatively at that point. Somebody who steps in and goes, okay, well, what you've done so far is great, but now you need to get a perm and you know, change the color of your hair. Um, well, maybe not, it's already working, you know? So I think that artists having to um, get to first base and you know, on their own is, is on balance a good thing. Um, it's also reflected, what it reflects is it reflects the change in the way that the business works as a whole. Um, once upon a time, the audience used to shop from a menu that was prepared for them by major media filters. So they shopped from the MTV playlist, the K-Rock playlist, the Rolling Stone reviews. That was the shortlist which some knowledgeable soul had prepared for them and they ordered off that menu. Now what happens is that the menu is basically infinite. It's whatever your friends tell you about, it's all available at a click. So how do you actually manage to kind of make some sense of that process, right? If you're a, 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 an artist and a, and, a, and a music consumer. And what ends up happening is that all of these other gatekeepers, if you like, are now hanging back and watching what the audience is, is liking before they come on board. So the radio station is more likely to play the song that's already getting some kind of traction, be it through live exposure, be it through Beatport, be it through SoundCloud, be it through YouTube. Um, so in order to, the, the whole process is, has reversed. It used to go from the artist to the person that made the menu and onto the consumer. Now it goes from the artist to the consumer and back to the person who makes the menu. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, I think that that's the other reason why you need to get to first base, because if you don't, you're gonna find it very difficult to find a promoter who's willing to put you on the show, a booking agent who's willing to take you on, a reviewer who's willing to give the album a review, a manager who's willing to take you on, a record store that wants to have you do an in-store, whatever the case may be. If you wanna actually get on people's radar now, you have to actually demonstrate a connection with an audience to begin with. You have to build it and then they'll come. What's the realistic time frame in order to break an act today? I think every artist has a different career trajectory. You know, every artist manager relationship is different um, because every artist is different. And so you need to be able to have a bespoke solution for each, um, each career situation. Um, I think typically these days, uh, there is more of an expectation that success will come more quickly perhaps than it used to do. Um, but even then, it can still take many years before the manager's in a position where the entire exercise makes sort of business sense. Um, you know, if you were analyzing these things from a cold business perspective, you'd probably never do anything. Um, you know, you start from a position of just being passionate and, you know, signing the artist because you just have no choice but to sign them, you have to try to get involved. Last year, your client, Gautier, had one of the largest hits in the world, someone that I used to know. Can you talk about the origins of that and how that record spread? Somebody that I used to know is a good example of how new media can be a massive positive for artists. That's a song that in many ways doesn't fit radio formats. It ended up, of course, being played everywhere, but most people when they heard it first said that it needed an edit, um, that it was gonna struggle at commercial radio. We probably thought the same. 
Um, but what happened was that when the video that, that Wally made with Natasha Pincus got online, um, the, the power of the song combined with the power of that, the images and the performances of Wally and Kimbra in that clip just really seemed to strike a chord with people. You know, particularly, I think anybody who's ever been jilted in a relationship really enjoyed the, the, the moment in where, where Kimbra steps into the song. That gave it an unbelievably, um, a great deal of viral power. So through Facebook, through Twitter, um, through YouTube, people were able to share the music and it spread from there. Now, of course, that gets you to a certain point. Um, and after that point, a whole heap of other uh, media starts to pile onto it. And each time they do, that amplifies it further and amplifies it further because you're reaching um, people who maybe aren't as engaged m musically as those who are getting online every day and reading a blog and you know, very active music consumers. You're reaching out to people who have lives to lead and other stuff going on. So um, you get you know, radio airplay from alternative stations. Then you get radio airplay from Hot AC and eventually from pop radio stations. You have the artists doing KCRW and Jimmy Kimmel and then before you know it, you're doing Saturday Night Live and then Glee are using the song. And at that point, you're seven months in and there's people really discovering it for the first time at that moment. Despite the fact that if you rewound seven months in the first week, it was obvious that this song was something incredibly special because it went from zero to 100,000 to 200,000 to 300,000 YouTube views really, really quickly. You know, and that just kept piling on and piling on and piling on until it's, you know, I haven't even looked lately, 400 million or something now. So, um, and not that it's all about YouTube, although that was a big factor, but it's a good um, sort of indicator, I suppose, of the exponential curve that happens when something has that quality of being remarkable in the sense of both being very good and in the sense of having people want to tell their friends about it. John, beyond the music, what are the qualities that you personally look for in any client that you're willing to take on? Um, when we take on a client, it, it's entirely a, a gut thing in the first instance. This either feels like something I have to be involved in mm -hmm. or it's something I'm going to pass on. If you don't feel compelled by it, like really compelled, like I'm going to be devastated if I can't find a way to work with this artist, then the answer is going to be no. You know? Now, some years ago, I was asked to do a, uh, a thing at a, at a music conference to flesh that out a little bit, to talk, to sort of deconstruct it, I suppose. And so I backwards analyzed what is it I'm actually doing when I'm having that gut process. And, um, and what I came up with was that there were eight things I was essentially checking. I wasn't this cold and premeditated about it, but when I sort of stopped and really thought, what am I doing? I'm, I'm actually looking for a reason not to do it in one of eight ways. The first thing I'm looking for are the songs. Are there really truly great songs here? That's the number one most important thing for my way of thinking. Is there a great voice? Doesn't necessarily have to be you know, pitch perfect, but does it have character? Does it, have, you know, does it strike a chord within you? Um, is there some kind of instrumental capacity? That's the one that musicians tend to overemphasize in my opinion. And in some cases it can be important. Eddie Van Halen, Keith Moon, but most times, you know, a basic level of instrumental proficiency is all that's required. You don't actually need to be a virtuoso. Um, the fourth thing is image, which often means sex appeal, but not always. Meatloaf doesn't have sex appeal, but he has image. Iggy Pop arguably doesn't have sex appeal. He certainly has image. Um, so some sort of striking, uh, you know, identity, which brings you to the fifth thing, which is a story. Um, ideally linked in with all of the above, somewhere that you come from, some interesting thing about your background and, and you know, how you're making music and what you've got to say. The sixth thing is a drive. That drive can sometimes be reflected in a more careerist kind of way, I suppose, you know, being organized and you know, really working hard and being willing to get up and do breakfast radio interviews. Other times that drive can be reflected in just being obsessive about you know, making music and making videos for your music and writing blogs and just expressing yourself and being bubbling over with creativity. That drive is really key now because there's more onus on the artist to do more. And the seventh and eighth things are not really within the artist's control so much, but you do need to be aware of them and they're luck and timing. Um, so there is always an element of luck. Um, you, know, you might get picked up for the iPod ad or you might not. Um, there's also always an element of timing. If you come along as a guitar band a couple of years ago, you're probably struggling, whereas now, 
you know, actually there's a lot greater openness to it because of the changing complexion of, of media and the success of a couple of other artists who have guitars. So, but as an artist, you can at least be aware of that so that you don't dis get discouraged by your bad timing and also you can take advantage of your good timing. So what I kind of came to realize that is that when I'm looking at an artist, I'm kind of quickly running through in a checklist in my mind looking for the, th are they missing any of those eight things? If I come up with no, then that's what, what the gut reaction is. Um, and it's a little bit like winning the lottery, you know. Um, it's very easy to get five numbers or four numbers out of the eight. You know, do, do you guys, does your lottery work that way where you tick the boxes out of 80? We call it the lotto in Australia. Um, very easy to get three or four out of the eight. Pretty hard to get four or five out of the eight. Almost unprecedented to get eight out of eight numbers. That's when you, when you win the big jackpot, right? And so that's the quality you're looking for where you can say this is, this is a project which has no weaknesses and therefore it's striking every possible chord within me that I want to be involved.